All right. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to thank the Maybergs personally, to be surrounded by family and friends. Uh, so let's start off and, uh, with a little catching up. Uh, both of you are working on very exciting new projects. So I thought we'd give everyone a softball and uh, ask you what is interesting to you today and what are you working on, David? Uh, okay, first, um, thank you for GW for employing this woman. Uh, a great teacher and friend to me for many, many years. Uh, couldn't hold down a job before, but it's good. Um, uh, and I will be brief. I know most of you are Jews in this room. You didn't come here to hear me speak. You came here to hear yourself speak. Uh, so They may have come for the food. <laughs> I will get out of the way. Uh, well, mostly, uh, Donald Trump has given me a reason to live. Uh, so twice a week, I get to futilely take a whack at him. I noticed among all the, the landmarks that President Knapp mentioned, Hotel. the Trump Hotel was uh, foremost among uh, the, you can see right out that window. I'm writing a book Settle called down. Um, <laughs> The Four Commitments. Uh, and the basic idea of the book is that um, most of us make four big commitments in our lives to a spouse and family, to a philosophy or faith, to a community, and to a vocation. And our, um, our, the fulfillment of our lives depends on how well we choose those commitments and then execute upon them. And so in a society, as I'll talk about doubtless later, that has become too individualized and too atomized, uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to the Middle Ages when we were locked into social roles. But I think if we can become better at commitment making and sticking with commitments over decades, then we will have a, a richer social fabric and better lives. Excited to read it. How about you? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say first that it is a really happy moment for me to see my beloved friend Erica, supported by my beloved friends Lewis and Manette, in such an absolutely essential, almost emergency footing endeavor. Um, there is nothing that the Jewish community in the United States more desperately needs than education. Nothing. Um, and we can talk about how criminally uneducated American Jewry is right now. Um, I am launching a new journal of ideas sometime this summer. Uh, it will be on paper before it's digital. Basically what I'm doing in the shorthand for it is I'm bringing back partisan review circa 1954 is what I'm doing. But with a very, very sober and anxious feeling that too many things in which we believe have broken down. Uh, certainly too many things that I believed in and beliefs that I can still ardently defend have become disgraced or delegitimated or banished from our discourse both in foreign policy and domestic policy, in our sense of ourselves as an American community, I have a feeling of entropy and anarchy and um, incoherence and volatility, and it frightens me, and it frightens me. I think that there are poisons that are loose in the land that will not easily be called back. And I'm just, this journal, I hope, part of this is a war of ideas. I'm one of those people who was raised by warriors of ideas. They were my teachers. And I believe that no important dimension of public life is lacking in an intellectual aspect, and that the role of intellectuals such as myself is to create a climate of ideas that makes certain cultural and political and social possibilities possible. Um, and that's what I will be doing. Um, and even, you know, and the, 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 in the short term, it will be absolutely futile. There's no question in my mind about that. But ideas don't work in the short term, and Chartbeat doesn't tell you anything about them, and influence cannot always be quantified and datafied. I have no doubt that if the ideas are worked at and developed over, a long, over the long term, that certain important battles can be won so that my son will grow up in a society in which certain what used to be common sense notions of decency uh, and patriotism um, will be restored. Um, other than that, nothing. Okay. <laughs> so neither of you are working on big projects, really? No, no, no. no. Uh, commitment and the restoration of decency. So we're here um, to celebrate education, to think about the limits of education, to think about character building in education. 
Um, David, you wrote an, an impressive bestseller, uh, The Road to Character. So we have a lot of language, uh, not only in the Jewish community, but in kind of new age spirituality about journeys and you know, roads and paths and journeys. Um, and and it, it strikes me that we don't talk enough about destinations, right? That where's the road going? So if I were to say to you, you could have a magic wand, David, and you could, um, your road to character would drive straight to a school that built character. So tell me what you're doing to teach character. I, well, a couple of things leap to mind. Uh, I, I had a, uh, I was writing a, 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 a column on how hard it is to teach character in a classroom. And I got an email from a guy named Dave Jolly, who's a, um, a veterinarian in Oregon. And he said, you can't teach character by talking to students who are thinking about their girlfriends or their MCATs. Uh, but never forget that what a wise person says is the least of that which they give. What gets communicated is the totality of their being revealed in the smallest gestures. Never forget the message is the person. And those phrases stuck in my head. Never forget that a what a wise person says is the least of what which they give. Never forget the message of the person. And so when we think back on our schooling, a lot of what we don't remember is what got taught in the classroom, but we remember our teachers and the way they taught it. I went to the University of Chicago. My favorite line about Chicago is it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> uh, and I remember, I've heard you say that before. Yeah, I've said that before. I've actually heard other people say that. Yeah, it's still a good line. Uh, and um, I remember my professors and their fervor for ideas and their belief that these books had the magic keys to the kingdom. And that has never gone away from me. And a lot of the seeds they planted me with Edmund Burke and other people have bloomed later in life. So that's one thing. The second is, is, so the, that inti one thing in, is the intimate connection between professors and students. students. So I, t I teach at Yale. I take my students out for a dinner between 9.30 and 1 in the morning every week. And that's when we actually make our connections. And then the knowledge to know how much to reveal in the classroom of oneself. Mm -hmm. One doesn't want to be a lot. I, I had a personal problem about two years ago, and I had to tell my students, um, you know, I'm going to have to cancel the office hours tonight. I'm just dealing with something personal. That's all I said. And I got about two thirds of them wrote to me that night, offering concern, and it totally changed that class for the rest of the term. And so I do believe professors are a little too distant. So do you make sometimes. it up now? Like, yeah, now, yeah, now I, well, I, have every enough, semester. I have enough personal crises to class <laughs> me through. Uh, the second thing is moral ecologies. We tell students, come up with your own moral vision. If your name is Aristotle or Nietzsche, maybe you can do that. The rest of us need to borrow somebody else's. And so we just need to present to them the different moral ecologies that have been handed down by our traditions. And then the final thing I'll say I could go on for a long time, and again, this is not common, is to teach people beauty uh, and how to fall in love with things. Plato had this famous passage where he said, we climb a ladder of beauties. If you teach somebody a beautiful face, they realize there's a higher beauty, which is a beautiful idea. And then if you teach people about a beautiful idea, there's a higher beauty, which is social justice. And if, then they realize there's an even higher beauty, which is the transcendental oneness of creation from which nothing can be added and nothing can be distracted, and that is God. And so if we give students access to beautiful things and teach them the, and example to them the, the idea of falling in love with these things, I think that will, have, that will create an emotional atmosphere where they, they can appreciate the, uh, the awe and mystery of, of pure beauty. Mm, thank you. Beautiful. So, Leon. In the Weasel Tear School for Character, what are we teaching? Uh, Bubba Mitzia, just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, Tractate of Talmud for. Um, uh, I'd say a few things. I mean, I was the luckiest student who ever walked the earth. If I'd been born five years later or gone to a different university, everything would have been different. But I am the son of more extraordinary fathers. Um, and I've thought a lot about what studenthood means. Um, I guess I should start with a, an anecdote. About 25 years ago or so, at the end of the day, at the, the New Republic, thank you, Michael, for that little cottage you made over it. Um, my assistant poked his head into my room and said, can I speak to you? And I said, yeah, sure. And he wanted to talk about two things. The first one was, that he'd been reading Nietzsche and he was having some difficulty understanding something, so we pulled it off the shelf and we looked at it, fine, we figured it out. 
Second thing was he was having some trouble with his girlfriend and wanted to talk about romance and the body. And we, you know, I don't know that we figured it out, but we had a very good conversation. Then he left, and as he left, I realized I had this moment where I realized it's flipped. He he has come to me the way I used to go to my teachers. And then I thought, Weasel Tear, there are two possible conclusions to be drawn from this. The first one is that you are exactly as great as your teachers were. The second one is that your teachers were winging it too. <laughs> and, um, and I learned a lesson about the creatureliness of teachers that day. When I teach Rambam, when I teach Maimonides, who, as you know, presented himself and in some ways was the single most terrifying intellect. I mean, he was definitive, he was the end, he covered everything. Was, uh, the, I spend two hours first teaching the letters we have from him to establish his creatureliness, that he went into a depression when his brother died at sea, that he was paranoid about a mediocre rabbi in Baghdad who didn't deserve to sit in a sukkah with him. Um, and I want people to understand this, this. I think you have to teach young people first that anything valuable worth studying is larger than any one of us. Their study is a weird combination of arrogance and humility. I don't discourage arrogance because I think that the mind has to go farther than sometimes it knows how to or should. Um, and I don't want to beat any mind back. But it is very important for me that young people, that my students, and I teach at universities all over the place, um, that they have some sense of where they are, what, their, what the scale of this is, what the scale of this is. The second thing is that I teach students that they have to have beliefs. They cannot just have sensations, and they cannot just have inherited possessions. They have to have beliefs. You need a worldview. Most Americans don't know how to have a worldview anymore. You know, in this society right now, the most important question you can ask about something is not is it true or false, or is it good or evil, or is it beautiful or ugly, but how does it work? That's the smartest question you can ask. I regard that as an inferior question as a technical question. And the important thing is, um, the important thing is to learn how to have beliefs, which is to say, to have reasons for beliefs. I want my students to be able to justify what they believe. That doesn't mean that their belief is correct. But I want people to have the self-respect of, of, of believers, secular and religious, secular and religious. And the third thing I would say, and this actually goes to the question of Jewish education, is that whereas we all try to teach our children conviction, uh, we all, as Americans and as Maimonidean Jews and as observers of human life, are, f are acutely aware of the freedom of their minds. So whatever we try to teach them to believe, they will believe what they wish. But what we can teach them, what we do have control over, is not the teaching of conviction, but the teaching of competence, of intellectual competence of what knowledge is and what knowledge isn't, of what an opinion is and what a belief is, what it means to know something and what it means not to know something, how to argue, how to think critically, how to think critically without sitting, thinking inhumanely. Um, competence, competence. Um, if we can send, if I send, if I can send my son out into the world feeling that he's competent, then I will regard my, my job as done, even though he may wind up believing all sorts of stuff that I think is nonsense. Okay. So using, borrowing the expression that you used about thinking critically but humanely, um, I'd love for both of you to talk about the breakdown of civil discourse that we're experiencing, um, I think nationally in the political domain, but, but also within the Jewish community of people not being able to have civil conversations around politics in America and also in Israel, where people said, and I've, I've heard this, I, I can't have so-and-so at my Shabbat table, this person voted differently than I did, or I, I, you know, we think so differently about Israel that there's just, there's, there's no place for a conversation, which strikes me as so odd given that every page of Talmud is about the rigor of debate and the importance so of debate is. and the notion and ethics of the fathers of a machlok et l'shem shamayim, an argument for the sake of heaven. And you just, you've got to wonder where those arguments for mm. the sake of heaven are. So, Leon, do you want to start Look, us I off think, on that? Um, 
You're absolutely right. In Judaism, certainly, there is no fantasy of unanimity or consensus, none. What we believe in is argument, disagreement, respectful disagreement. The Talmud preserves minority opinions because one day they may be relevant to the continuation of the discussion. Um, you know, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These, all these are the words of the living God. Um, and all these words, by the way, do not go together. They can't all be right. Um, in the secular political world in which we live, just to speak abstractly, I think that the fantasy of consensus, certainly of unanimity, is an authoritarian Rousseauist fantasy. Um, there is no such thing as the general will and there is no such thing as the people. That diversity of opinion and the absence of uniformity is one of the irreducible facts of human intellectual and social life and is owed ultimately to the most basic fact of human life, which is individuation, that I am not you and you are not me. There is nothing more basic than that. So I think that, um, ha having said that, I should go on and say that I am not, um, I'll get to the problem in a minute, I don't freak out about polarization the way other people do. I freak out more about suppression of thought and suppression of speech. I think that the people who drafted our Constitution Madison in particular, were aware that faction would be an irreducible characteristic of everything that followed. Um, and so I have never regarded in my work, and I'm a little bit infamous for it, um, I have never regarded civility as a primary intellectual virtue. I think that people who are arguing about fundamental questions, about first principles, should thicken their skins because the stakes are really high and we can't all be right. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't mean one should go savaging other people and so on. And what we're seeing in our country, it's not just that there's po polarization. I mean, I will take, by the way, polarization, and uh, forgive me, I'm not going to talk politics tonight, but over what Trump described in his inaugural address, the idea that there's him and there's the people, and he understands what the people want, and they know that he understands. That's, I'll take polarization over that any day, because that's a sign of democratic life. That's a sign that an open society is functioning. Um, I do think that some of the bitterness is politically manipulated. I think that the media, especially the electronic media, have um, radicalized everything. So that not just now, not just the internet, even I remember in the golden days of Crossfire in the late 19th century, um, <laughs> when um, it, it was already the view that the, the truest expression of a proposition is always its most extreme expression. And if you don't say it in its most extreme way, then you're just a coward, then you don't have the courage of your convictions and get out of the way. And get out of the way. I detest that view. I absolutely detest it. The center is not 50% of the right and 50% of the left. Liberalism is not half of conservatism and half of radicalism. There are independent autonomous worldviews that are complex, all of them, all of them. And we have to, and, and since, and here I'll finish, and since an open society does something that no other form of government does, for better and for worse, which is it imposes, we were talking about this over lunch the other day, um, it imposes an enormous intellectual responsibility on ordinary men and women, right? Since we govern ourselves by our opinions, the quality of our opinions determines the quality of our society. So the quality of our opinion formation, which is our education, comes in determines that, right? We live in a society in which it actually matters what people think. Now this is both noble, no, ennobling and unbelievably heartbreaking when you look at what passes for democratic deliberation in our society, both electronically and in the real world. So it's a complicated answer. Um, I don't much like niceness. I like respect. I don't like niceness. Um, I always, it, anyway, I don't like niceness. I don't like niceness, all right, Eric? I heard you. Okay. I heard you. Um, I like it. Okay, I, like I don't, well, not till you apologize okay. to me. Okay. Um, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's my answer. David? I'd like to congratulate Leon on his authenticity and his dislike of niceness. Uh, uh, I, I guess a few things. First, I do mind polarization, uh, in part because I think it's a violation of humility. To me, uh, humility is... Um, my favorite edition of humility, which I read somewhere, is uh, radical self-honesty from a position of other-centeredness, which is the ability to get outside yourself and see yourself honestly. And that allows for a little arrogance. Because we all have some 
uh, good traits, but aroused for some awareness of one's own brokenness. And when one does that, one realizes that most, especially political arguments, are debates between partial truths. And there's uh, an element of truth in most positions, and most things are tensions between freedom and security, or equality and achievement, that these are just perpetual balances. And I don't think being a moderate is being in the middle, but it's finding the right balance in that particular moment. One of my favorite philosophers, Michael Oakeshott, says politics is simply steering your ship through a storm and trying to get through the day and shifting your weight. And so I think polarization has made it hard for us to shift our weight. The second thing it's done is it's changed what people can think. And so before, uh, 10 years ago, um, the vast majority of Republicans thought that personal character was utterly essential in a national leader. And now the vast majority don't think it's essential. A few years ago, I think 10 or 15 percent of Republicans had a positive view of Vladimir Putin. Now 40 percent do. And so, again, not criticizing Donald Trump, but it means your, the, your team has determined your worldview. And that's just not the way, that's not why we go to universities, and that's not what we believe in. And so it has had this powerful distorting effect. And then finally, um, one of the, th the things we've lost faith of, and this is a bit consistent with what Leon was saying, is politics. The belief in the political process, which involves argument and discussion. There is, uh, it's messy and it involves compromise, but it is a, a way of resolving dispute. And you can either, resolve, in a diverse society, you can re resolve, re resolve dispute through politics or through authoritarianism. And the impatience with politics in that process, I think, has been severely corrupting. The final thing I want to say, because rudeness is not the only problem. I often tell the, I was at a, uh, the Annenberg Foundation funded something called the Civility Summit, where they took 140 members of Congress and their families, and they brought them out to the Greenbrier for a weekend. And we all got to see each it's other. It's very easy to be civil there. I well, think the I, I'm Greenbrier walking down the hallway in the afternoon, and there's a woman crying in the hallway. And she'd been so brutally attacked at one of the breakout discussion sessions, they, she left the room in tears. And this was the civility summit. <laughs> right, right, so, right. Uh, but the, the one thing I, I wanted to pick up on, it, again, to defend argument, is that part of what we complain about with polarization is, is incivility and self-closure. But it's also true that in universities among students, it's often hard to get an argument started. And that often students want to apologize first. I'm sorry to disagree, but, or they dissolve into what Alistair McIntyre calls emotivism, whatever feels good is right for you and whatever feels good is right for me. And so when Leon emphasizes the other side, uh, the, the false superficiality of niceness, um, that's also a, a genuine problem. <coughs> I just want to add to what my friend said. I think that it's very important that we classify the kinds of subjects about which we're seeking the truth. There are debates in which it is the case that everybody has a piece of the truth, and we have to know that. But I would say t there are two other things we have to remember. One is that when four people are at the table, the truth is not 25% of what each one says. Um, and that sometimes somebody is wrong and somebody is right, and it is not an act of hegemonic patriarchal imperial imp oppression to suggest that two plus two is not five. It really isn't. Uh, and people should have, and secondly, there are, it's related to that, there are certain questions that we debate in which there is no other side to the question. The question of whether the Holocaust happened is not a question that has two sides. The question of whether or not um, the ice caps are melting is not a question that has two sides. The question of whether the Jews control the banks is not a question that has two sides. And it's very important that we know when we have to engage intellectually and when, in fact, we have a political battle on our hand against patent falsehood. I'm not saying um, what the falsehoods are. I'm saying that there are falsehoods and that they have caused atrocious, immeasurable human suffering and that we have to have the spine that it takes to look someone in the face and say, actually, you are completely wrong, and et cetera. Yeah. So 
You know, we're talking about debate and civil discourse and the breakdown of civil discourse and thinking about remedying it. And, and actually, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think that for people who do feel confused or frustrated or even despairing now, you know, we, we sometimes problematize so much that we don't celebrate what is working right. And so it's one of the things that I see so much in the Jewish community. In fact, we were just uh, this. Uh, we we spent um, most of the day in uh, as part of the Mayberg Center launch in a um, in a small conference of academics and practitioners on the state of Jewish leadership education, and um, and one of the speakers brought up the idea that we treat people as problems or we treat situations from a problematic dimension. So I'm wondering, what do you think the Jewish community is getting right? right now that we could celebrate. <laughs> that um, was not, you weren't supposed to laugh. I no. know, <laughs> I'm not. Um, you not. want to talk about, look, generally I'd say that when you look at any reality, there are always grounds for optimism and always grounds for pessimism, except in very rare and tragic cases. And the question that always has to be asked is with respect to what? Um, I'm not a great admirer of the current spiritual or cultural condition of the American Jewish community. I think that American Jewish identity has been wildly over-politicized, wildly over-politicized. I think that if you woke up any American Jew in the middle of the night and said, Obama or Netanyahu, Iran deal, no Iran deal, they'd have the answer. But if you said to them, what is Zionism, what are the Jewish people, what are the tenets of the Jewish faith, they would not know how to begin. Because all the only answers they know are political answers. In fact, our community has basically been slowly transmogrifying into a lobby of some kind. Mm -hmm. And with all the important tasks that all the lobbies, APAC, J Street, you name it, pick your lobby. But, but you know, with all the important work that they all have to do, a community is not a lobby. It really is not. So we're we, getting to the positive side of what we're going to celebrate <laughs> soon? No, I, I, well, well, positive? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I'll tell you what's positive. You can eat quinoa and Pesach. That's positive. <laughs> That's positive. Um, I mean, it's, it's only, but aside, it's aside from that, I'm having like trouble. Quinoa. I'm having trouble, Eric. <laughs> no, but I will tell you. No, no, no. Look, look, look. I'm very severe with our brothers and sisters here. They don't know a damn thing almost. They don't know Hebrew. They cannot read their own texts. English is not a Jewish language. Judaism has a language and a great language which none of them can read. And I'm not going to go on about that because I'm a maniac about that. But they don't know that the essence of Judaism, of Jewish identity, is religious, whether they like it or not. And a certain degree of competence in Judaism is required for an honorable Jewishness. And inversely or conversely, they also don't know that religion is not the only Jewishness there is. Most American Jews have no idea of the richness of the tradition that they have inherited. Zero. They do not know about the poets, the philosophers, the moralists, the courtiers. They do not know about, they, do, they know almost nothing. And this is happening, in, you know, we are losing, more of the Jewish tradition is slipping through our fingers in conditions of security and prosperity than ever slipped through our fingers in conditions of insecurity and oppression. Now, I'm not saying that a little anti-Semitism would be good for the Jews. Tacitus said this, Spinoza said this. If you're celebrating anti-Semitism, we're really in bed. <laughs> we're really Look, you asked for the good news, right? <laughs> it's just, I mean... No, 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 but I, I, I actually, I, I have to say, I search my heart. I love my Jewish brothers and sisters. You know, what's that verse? that the, she says to Elisha, betocha mi anochi yoshave. I, I live among my people. And I, you know, we are together in many, many ways, but I have to say that my heart is cracked by the extent to which that they are proudly ignorant of the vast majority of their tradition. It is so depressing because, not, because I think it is a matter of honor. I have always thought this about any tradition that I have inherited I don't know what happens after me. It will not die on my watch. It will not die on my watch. We live in a culture that prides in, you know, cherishes innovation and disruption, but we are not just innovators and disruptors. We are guarantors and stewards and trustees. And a tradition that was not supposed to make it, that was supposed to have been destroyed a long time ago, has miraculously made it right into our laps. And most American Jews treat it negligently. And I think that is criminal.
Otherwise, the situation's terrific. <laughs> All right, Mr. Brooks. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's time to save the day. Uh, I'm just gonna go suck on the gas pipe. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's from right, from right to left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, no, Leon's too optimistic. Uh, <laughs> Now, I guess I, I'm trying to, I'm thinking, well, first, let's not, let's not knock prosperity, which is a feature, a continuing feature of the Jewish people. Second, I think well, I wasn't, by the way. Excuse me? I wasn't knocking I know, I'm, I'm, I'm not. This is not a rebuttal. No, no, no. no. Uh, You're second, the capitalist apologist. I do think the, the superstructure is in good shape. I largely agree with Leon about the, the mental substance, but the there are the growth of organizations. That's right. I think it's quite strong. When you go around the, to That's schools, right. Hillel, Chabad, you go to cities, federations. I'm involved in a group in New York called Natan, which gathers donors who are younger than are comfortable with federation. Uh, and everywhere I go, you see organizations that are structurally strong and thriving and usually decently funded. So to me, that's a sign of hope. The, second, the third thing I would say, and I was talking, I'm going to drop a name, but uh, to Rabbi Sachs today on the phone. And we were talking about... I thought you were going to say Bruce Springsteen, but um, <laughs> dropping a name is Rabbi Zach. We, we were at a conference call <laughs> with Celine Dion. I was Dion. talking to Nachmanides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, we were talking about the, um, the public intellectuals in society. I, I, I think I share Leon's belief that American discussion is over-politicized and under-moralized. We talk too much about politics, too little about spiritual and moral matters. And so the question I asked him was, well, who is the Heschel of today? Who is the Buber of today? Who is the Reinhold Niebuhr of today? And I said to him, you know, it's basically you. And he said, well, you'll think, who do you think of the names who can talk about spiritual matters and talk about political matters and broader national questions? He mentioned this guy. He mentioned Leon Cass. He went through a bunch of names, and not just picking out Jews, but 80% of them were Jews. And so there is something, if you think of the big public intellectuals who are alive today, disproportionately Jewish for some reason. I want to add something to what you just said. Was no, you want to interrupt something, but go ahead. No, <laughs> no. no, go ahead. I'm, I'm sure. No, you finish, 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 finish. No, no, I'm, I'm, no finish, I'm, finish. I, I'm, I'm All right. eager. I didn't think there was much left in what you were saying, so I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, institution building, we have a genius for it. And one of the things that has enabled our tradition to survive is our genius for institution building. You see it in the earliest Middle Ages, in the 10th century, and even before. However, if you look at American Jewry and you do a survey of their achievements, you find that American Jewry has excelled organizationally, institutionally, sociologically, economically, politically, uh, and so on. In building structures, scaffolding, my role, as I've always seen it, and I know it's a division of labor, somebody has got to see about the boiler, right? Um, is what's, what happens in those institutions? What happens in those institutions? And if those institutions are being created and the activities, the spiritual, intellectual, cultural activities in those institutions are less strict and less rich, than they should be. It's, I mean, I think that the only standard that the Jewish community ever should judge itself is the classical Jewish standard, not the American standard. We, you know, we've never, America's a revolution in Jewish history, but Jews have never, French, the French Jewish community never judged itself by French standards. The German Jewish community never by German standards. We have a tradition, and it has certain standards of richness and rigor and so on. And those are, those, that's the standard by which I have to compare myself. And so all the institution building in the world is terrific, but then somebody has to worry about what takes but place. But this is not a Jewish problem, this is an American That's problem. That's correct. That's correct. And so, you know, I did this book, and it was based on a Joseph Soloveitchik distinction between Adam I and Adam II. And we live in a culture that's pretty good at the majestic Adam, and it's pretty bad at Adam II, at the, hum at the humble Adam. And that is true for Christians, Jews, atheists. I mean, the, this, and one of the things I would hope for the center is to just teach the words, the words like sin and redemption uh, and Exodus, Genesis. Just teach the words because it's very hard to have a conversation about what's happening in your own life, let alone a broader moral conversation, if you don't know what the basic words mean. 
And the second thing, and I, it came to me as, as the Maybergs were speaking, was um, this is an era, a generation coming up that won't have access to Holocaust survivors. Uh, and that, that presents a unique moment. Maybe everyone else in this room has thought about it, but I had never thought about it. A moment to, because as we all know, sometimes the Holocaust had become a stand-in for Jewishness and become the central narrative. Uh, and so it is an opportunity to reintroduce people, both to the people I revere, the Heschels and the Soloveitchiks, but also to you know, re restore the centrality of God. And I, I was glad to hear God mentioned because you go to a lot of Jewish events and God is not in the room. Uh, and I mean, that's what it is, that is the core. So um, as uh, we close this conversation, um, we've created this wonderful new platform at GW. Uh, if we could have any conversation here that's important about Jewish education, leadership, integrity, character building, what do you think we should talk about? You go first. I have nothing to say right now. Give me 30 seconds. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> I think there are a couple of things. I would say, first, I think that young Jews have got to be exposed to the richness of their own tradition. They don't know about it. They don't know how humanly primary it is. The reason to study Jewish history is not because one is a Jew. That's just one reason. Another reason is because it is one of the greatest human stories ever told. Uh, and our young people are brought up in bubbles, and we w our, our ideal for educating them is to have them reproduce us, uh, and so on. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, but they are not aware of the richness, and if you pardon the expression, the sexiness of the Jewish tradition. It is astonishing. It is astonishing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they need to be shown it's that, that it is valuable, and maybe, no, this is a different point. It's not just valuable because it's theirs. It's intrinsically valuable. It's intrinsically valuable. Um, you know, the fact that something is mine does not, is not much of a recommendation for it, right? I mean, that's just narcissism. But if you can find in what you've inherited and what is, as an accident of birth or history yours, if you can find in it an intrinsic necessity so that you show that it's intrinsically beautiful and deep and valuable, then you've actually created the continent in which young Jewish people can do their seeking. The Jewish tradition is like all great civilizations. It contains everything. It doesn't add up in many ways. <clears throat> You can be a mystic, you can be a rationalist, you can be a scholar. There are, I mean, there, there, there are, it doesn't all go together. That's what the Talmud is about, right? But what it is, it's a continent and a vocabulary within which you can ask the primary questions of life and begin to formulate answers in them. And if we can get young Jewish people to recognize that, to recognize that, that all the resources they need are, happen to be in what they already have, um, you know, I, I'll just, um, there's an, you know, a little word of Torah. Um, there, there's a, those of you who remember on, on Shavuot, on the holiday of Shavuot, when we bless the wine, we call it Zman Matan Torah Tein, the time of the giving of the Torah. The Kotzka Rebbe in the 19th century, a major remarkable man, um, asked a very obvious question, why don't we say Zman Kabbalat Torah Tein? Why don't we say the time of the receiving of the Torah? And he uh, he says, because giving and receiving are two entirely different things. The fact that you've been given something does not mean that you have received it. You have merely been given it. After you've been given it, you have to do the work that constitutes the reception of it. Otherwise, it continues to be an accident of birth. And accidents of birth, are no, that, that, they're not North Stars. One doesn't live one's life or raise one's children on accidents of birth. That's what I would say. Yeah. Okay, I've thought of something to say. Uh, and I'm going to say it in, in part because of Leon with some trepidation because what I'm about to say is a bit middle brow and I know Leon's going to disagree with the third. But I've been thinking a lot about the, the social circumstances that have created this election and a lot of the, the bad things that have happened in the country. And I, I basically ascribe our problem to a crisis of social solidarity a loss of social capital, a loss of social connection, 
a loss of relationship up and down across American society. And I think at the root of that is an intellectual problem, which is a false anthropology about what human beings are. Uh, and the middle brow way I'm going to express it is this way, that um, we've chosen John Stuart Mill when we should have chosen Martin Buber, which is to say we've treated people as individuals when Buber said all meeting is in count, all, all living is meeting, and treating people relationships first and we emerge out of relationships. So uh, we're too individualistic when we should be more communitarian. Second, we've chosen Jeremy Bentham when we should have chosen Viktor Frankl. So organizing life as a series of pleasure or pain, which is the language of economics, when the real motivator in life is the desire for meaning and purpose. And so we've been too utilitarian when we should have been more moralistic. And then the final is we've chosen Rene Descartes when we should have chosen the great Jewish scholar St. Augustine. Uh, and that is to say we've, we've chosen a view of human nature that believes we're primarily rational creatures, which is Descartes, when, when Augustine was actually right, that we're primarily loving, longing, and desiring creatures. And we're too cognitive when we should be more emotional. And so, to me, these three errors have led to a more atomized, individualistic, and segmented society. And so, even if you can only teach Augustine maybe a stretch, but Frankel and, uh, and, uh, and Buber would be a start. Oh, I want to thank both of you. That was you. all right. I don't know what that was okay. <laughs> Uh, both of you, uh, I want to thank both of you for the conversation. I want to thank the Maybergs for the possibility of the conversation and, um, and for the possibility that the Mayberg Center will be a forum where important and meaningful conversations can take place. Thank you so much for coming. I hope someone was writing all that down. Um, the accumulated knowledge and wisdom of this 45 minutes uh, was worthy of framing and preserving. I want to thank you, all three of you, David and Leon in particular, for being our guests tonight. What a great, great thrill. Um, and as usual, what happens after I read one of Leon's columns or one of David's columns, I usually need at least a few days to think, absorb, argue with myself, figure it out. Now they've pulled a fast one on me. I've got the two of them at the same time, and now on top of it, I've got Erica to deal with. I'm, I don't, please, my staff, don't ask me anything for the next week. I'm busy. Uh, before we break, I want to say again a special thanks to the Maybergs for now enabling this. Um, and I would like to ask you all to join me in applauding some of the most wonderful staff that anybody could ever be so grateful to have, in particular, Kevin Kennedy of our development shop. <clears throat> His assistant, Erica, who I'm not sure is here tonight. Stephanie Schwartz is here. Turan, Tess Cannon, who helped with all the logistics. And Ilana Weltman, who works with us on various of our programs. And for those of my staff and faculty who I have not singled out, I apologize, but you know how much I love you all. Thank you very much. Dessert is over there, and uh, you have earned your just desserts.